right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming down tonight. We are live from Books and Books in Coral Gables, Florida. So a note for our internet audience watching at home, if at any time during the presentation you'd like to purchase a copy of tonight's book, you can call the number on your screen. We'll take care of that for you. We'll, we'll get the book signed, and we will have it shipped to wherever you are in the United States free of charge. This evening, Books and Books is very happy to present Dr. Tanya Pergola and Mr. Lekoko Ole Sululu, uh, presenting her new book, Time is Cows, Timeless Wisdom of the Maasai, and here to introduce our special guests, please welcome to the microphone the founder of the Footprints Foundation, Ms. Lorna Owens. Okay, thank you. Um, welcome everyone. I hope you're excited as I am, because these amazing people here have been waiting for some time now for this to happen. Uh, so let's just get into the program. Dr. Tanya Pergola, she was born right here in the United States of Russian and Italian parents. Uh, she was drawn to Africa after she completed her doctoral studies in sociology at University of Washington. In Tanzania, she helped implement sustainable development projects through humanitarian organization Terawatsu, which she co-founded with Lakoka Ole Salulu, as well as she undertook a comprehensive apprenticeship with Maasai tradition, traditional healers. Combining indigenous Maasai teachings and wisdom with her studies as a Vedic master at the Chopra Center, which as you know is founded by Deepa Chopra, she currently guides personal journeys and healing safaris. These programs indicate yoga, meditation with indigenous and cutting edge social, sociology and also psychological technologies, helping people transform the world by transforming themselves. Her primary nest is here in Miami, but she also comes to us from her home in South Africa and also in Tanzania. With her, as and, and Tanya is my sister from another mother, and my brother from another mother is Lekoko Ole Sululu. She's, he's one of 11 children from his uh, father's first wife, and he was born um, in a traditional Maasai village in Tanzania. He spent his childhood herding his father's cattle, and he was initiated as a warrior, learning medicine from traditional plants of the Maasai and also some of the sacred rituals of the Maasai. He is an official guide to many travel agencies and travel companies to uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. So if you want to go to Mount Kilimanjaro, here's your guide. Uh, he's also co-owner of Terawatsu, which is an organization that is also that of Dr. Pergola. He's a respected Maasai um, elder. Uh, he's a traditional healer. He's, he is a herbalist. He comes here from Arusha, Tanzania. So with I'm very pleased to introduce two unlikely partners, Dr. Pergola and Salulu. You know, I've seen so many authors read here, and I always had the dream that one day I would be here. So this is very much a dream come true. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, Salulu reminded me today that it's actually a full moon, and he's going to share a little bit about oh, what yeah. that means. Oh, yeah, the full moon in Maasai it has a lot of meaning. It's successful or journey, especially on the light when you walk is the time to start your journey. So the full moon in Maasai is very important. So I'm very happy to be with you guys to share this is knowledge of indigenous people. And this is the first event of our journey. Uh, we're going to take this tour up the East Coast and then to Seattle and back. So it's a very special evening. I wanted to just say a little bit about the uh, how the book was conceived? Yeah, let's let's show that. First? Yeah. Okay. What do you see? Earth's ancient ecosystem is an intricately coded software program running perfect algorithms over billions of years, glued together by the laws of physics. Mishu Kaku once said, 
time is what makes us uniquely human. But since our priorities have changed, the important things fight for place in our lives. Could this disconnect from the Earth's rhythm perhaps have affected our perception of time? The way we express and control our emotions? The role it plays in supporting our basic mental, physical and psychological well-being? How could we possibly prioritize what's important without sacrificing the demands of the daily grind? What would we remember about our humanity that we think we've forgotten? Surely we have all the answers by now? When an accomplished academic traveled to Tanzania, the last thing she expected was to learn how to create time. A journey of discovery and remembering, unlike anything you've seen before. Meet our humble guardians with a power to bend time. A story about being found when we never knew A film company out of Los Angeles and the script writers from Cape Town. So we're very excited um, that it's going in that direction. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to say a few words about how the book was conceived. Um, I was actually living and working in Seattle after I finished my doctorate and doing research on Americans' interest in alternative medicine, it was called at the time, why people were going to chiropractors, acupuncturists, holistic medicine. This was in the mid-90s. And I traveled the United States interviewing people on why they were so keen to use that kind of, of medicine. And um, I then go to climb Mount Kilimanjaro and go on safari in Tanzania and started talking with the indigenous people that I met on the on the journey and I explained they always asked me what do, what do you do what what kind of work do you do and I I was talking about um, holistic medicine and they just looked at me like uh-huh yep and and I I could tell that like they knew something um, that I didn't know and I almost didn't have the, the questions. I didn't know how to talk. Um, Sulu was uh, trying to translate for me, but it was something else that I, I needed to learn. So I came back to, to Seattle and made a plan on how to get back to Tanzania and learn, go deep into the culture of, of the people there and find out what it was. It just felt like it was going to be in information that was useful. So I headed over to Tanzania. I, would say, I think it was around 2000, 2001, and uh, started an NGO and um, created, it was like a big exchange between uh, sharing my education from what I learned in the US and learning from the Maasai themselves. Twelve years later, um, I came back to the States. Um, I came back here about two years ago and felt it was time for me to share um, the knowledge that I had learned. So there were really two purposes for the book, very distinct purposes. Um, and Salulu will describe the first uh, purpose um, of sharing the knowledge of the, or documenting the knowledge of the Maasai. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, actually in Maasai, we don't have any documentary to put. We just have from your head everything like a trees, healing, you, you, you are not writing. So the time he came to the village, he told me, oh, why well you take this lady again? The Western lady, what are you going to tell her? Is it a religion or what? I say, no, you want to support indigenous uh, healing. Is it true? And they look, say, oh, 
they give a name it's called namelok the namelok is sweet sweet heart so they stay in the villages they eat the food with us with the with the mamas talking and then we try to teach them about environmental while we are born in the environmental because at Maasai we don't eat any game meat and you use the roots to, he to healing our disease. So he says this is a very important lady to have here in the villages. So he collected the woman group, tried to start now NGO, um, plant tree plant and then it's coming well now now and then I say okay another things we have to share with her to help us to put, to put some documentary of uh, books. Say, oh, and that is a good idea because why we have in the, in the church, you have a book, you must say you need to have something to talking and to tell our coming generation. So that is why they be respected in the, in the, in the community. So that was the first main purpose is to document a, a rapidly disappearing um, wisdom. At the same time, I knew that one of the best ways to conserve knowledge is to make it alive, make it active. And I'm like, you know what? This wisdom helped me so much in, in so many aspects of my life. I got to find a way to write it in a way that can help my tribe. Uh, I don't know exactly what that tribe was, a European, global woman who, um, lived in a modern society and I found the language of how to write that it's it's very much a handbook there's suggested practices on how you can implement some of this traditional knowledge in your everyday life um, so the book actually um, came out last December uh, end of 2013 um, and it was launched in Africa, where it was conceived. Um, so the first ever launch was in Johannesburg, um, during actually the week of mourning for Nelson Mandela had, had just passed away. And his very good friend who, who created the music for my DVD that I produced at the same time uh, came for the launch. And he played um, indigenous instruments and the South African National Anthem and welcomed the book into the world as a way to share indigenous knowledge. We then went up to Tanzania and the Maasai blessed the book project in Arusha. And then I came down to Cape Town to do a final event before coming back to the States. So I gave it a few months and now today is the launch in the, in the United yeah, and uh, another thing important is for her, many people, they come and they write the books, take a picture, put in the newsletter, but they never bring to us to Africa. So the people who was really appreciate for her to bring that is books, and they look at my picture, oh, this is Le Coco, oh, this is her, look it. <laughs> so everybody was surprised to see uh, what it bring back. So it was very interesting for her, what he, she did in, in the, our, our country and our village. We hope to actually do an audio book version in Ma, in his language, and have it as, a, as an app on the smartphone, so out in the Maasai villages, people will be able to have this knowledge forever. So let me read a few um, passages to you. Uh, this first section is from the chapter Knowing Yourself. Talking to your nature, appreciating Engai's plan. A few months after my decade-long apprenticeship with the Maasai was complete, and I had pursued further studies in indigenous Indian mind-body techniques and begun my own practice, I was asked to lead a group meditation at Gibbs Farm in Tanzania. Solulu was visiting the farm and asked if he could join with the visitors who were coming to the session. Afterward, I asked him what he thought of the practice. He said he particularly enjoyed the way in which I asked the participants to consider, who am I, what do I want, and how can I serve, before they went into silence. He said it reminded him of what the Maasai do when they talk to their nature. I was curious to know more how my training in Vedic sciences based on the Vedas 
the ancient Hindu scripture, was similar to Maasai practices. Salula reminded me that the Maasai belief in God, or Engai, is akin to what we term Mother Nature. Deep down, our soul is connected to nature very directly. When there are a lot of changes happening in the community and an individual Maasai begins to feel overwhelmed, he or she will go off alone to talk to their nature, sitting in silence under a tree and listening to what Engai is saying. So we'll explain that sometimes you see elders sitting under an acacia tree with their eyes closed. You might think that they are sleeping, but oftentimes they are practicing what we tend to call meditation. They sit cross-legged and close their eyes, asking, Engainarok, you are everywhere on this earth. Where can I go without you? Where can I sit without you? You know me from when I was born, and now I start to open my mind. If there is anything bubbling up from the heart, Salulu explained, you are open to talk to Engai, silently. You notice that the leaves are alive, the trees are alive, the water is alive, the wind is alive. I acknowledge that Engai put me here as one of the living, so I say, Ashe, thank you for recommending me to someone, to be someone to control the nature. That means thanking Engai for putting you here as a human, to do some things by harnessing and managing nature. You have to thank Engai for giving you air to breathe. You know, Maasai people feel very proud to be alive when they sit in this type of awareness. I asked him how long he normally sits when he talks to his nature. He said it varied from five to ten minutes up to an hour or more, depending on what was going on in your brain. Engai knows what is in your heart before you talk, he added but just saying it makes it stronger. EN is the feminine gender prefix in the Ma language, and many vitally important nouns are feminine. Engare is water, Engop, earth, world, Engima, fire, Engijape, air. We are all made up of a combination of the elements that exist in nature. When you talk to Engai, you know that Engai is the same as nature. The same water inside of you can also fall from the sky as rain. Maasai's believe children are born with specific talents or gifts, whether for singing or dancing, counseling, healing with plants, healing spirits, or painting and plastering the walls of huts. When they recognize a gift, they support the person in expanding that gift. For example, Salul explained, when a person speaks diplomatically from an early age, people can see this. He is really good. He knows things. We then tell others to go speak to this person if they have a problem, or we make him or her a chairperson. While every Maasai has a godfather or godmother to help guide her in her life, some also have advisors. An Ologalai is a male advisor and an Enengalai is a female advisor. It's important to keep secret who this person is, Lulu told me. No one knows but you. And this person is different than the godfather. The Ologalai is for discussion. The godfather makes the last decision. Some people have both godfather and godmother. Some women like to receive advice from a man. Some women like to talk with a woman. When young people know themselves well, they recognize what they can tell their parents and what they can tell a trusted older man, woman, or friend. You begin to strike an equilibrium in what you say or show people and what you don't. Open sharing is often filled with humor and lightheartedness, and the time of talking with your nature can be one of profound simplicity and honesty. So, at the end of that section is a suggested practice. How do you, how do you then implement that in your daily life? So yeah. where do you go to seek wisdom for yourself and for the important people in your life? Take a moment to identify the advisors in your life, both in the past and the present. Acknowledge and honor them and consider reconnecting if you have lost touch. If you are in need of an Ologlai or an Engelai, reach out to the developing global network of wise elders and junior elders. Their wisdom can transform your life. Yeah, um, 
Tanya, she said Troy didn't change anything. I was thinking uh, what he's going to say. <laughs> but in Africa or my tribe, as I already told you, Tanzania, we have 122 different tribes. And each tribe is, is as own language and own culture. So in Maasai, we have a culture who is very strong. For example, if you say Olageli or Enageli, you can go yourself. If you have a degree, you have a PhD, you need help from elders. You can walk up and say, oh, I want to go and do this one. No. You have to meditate and say, who are going to ask you this question? So you want to have somebody, they don't care, a female or male, but somebody you can get from meditation from the one of the group of the family. And that is why help us a lot. Nobody can kill himself. You know, somebody some, he can have a um, genetic disease or maybe he can get some problem in the community. Say, ah, what? They have history. They ask you, what, what is happening for this guy? So you have to call to, to tell somebody who can keep a secret and he can neutralize that things. So um, add, uh, um, godfather, godmother, or somebody very secret to you is very important. You can't go yourself. And that is very important for our community. Yeah, your, your whole world is not just in your own head. You're, you're always connected with your community. So decisions, um, everything is discussed as, as a group. OK, I'll read one more. Um, this is from the chapter on plant medicine. And it's called Soup for a Sister. Those of us living in modern societies have come to expect medicines and health treatments to work very rapidly. Fast-paced lifestyles present an important challenge to the holistic practice of traditional medicine. Traditional Maasai medicine and most traditional medicine systems is most successful when patient and healer have access to a large pharma pharmacopoeia of medicinal plants used for both prevention and cure of disease the active concern and support of an extended family, and time. The Maasai who still live primarily in the bush maintain an intimate connection between the natural world and their own bodies. There is a permeable boundary between their own skin and the space around them. It is as if the flow of whatever is going on outside, from sunshine to rain, cold weather to hot, finds its way inside the body. They will tell you that nature's rhythms move slowly in relation to modern clocks. In the Western world, a byproduct of extraordinary modern advances in medicine and technological procedures that treat the body has been a disintegration of the once intimate bond between the mind, heart, and emotions and the natural environment. Fixing the body has outpaced a necessarily parallel focus on rebalancing every aspect of an individual, something indigenous societies still understand very well. I remember getting a call when I was back in Seattle for a period of weeks from a friend who hoped I had some painkillers because she had thrown out her back. Her question surprised me because, like me, she was a practicing yogi and more likely to use gentle asanas to relieve back pain than to pop pills. I knew she must be in serious pain. I told her I had nothing in the house, but that I could stop by a drugstore and, br and bring something to her, mentioning, too, that Tallulah was visiting from Tanzania. I explained to him that she was really sick and we needed to go bring her medicine. You're going to cook for her, right? It is dinner time. She has to eat, he said. I was already back in the mindset of Seattle culture. I quickly realized. In Tanzania, of course, not only would I go to a sister's home to help her get better, I would stay with her. Women did it for me in Tanzania, as did the friend who had come to my house to make me mtori, made a banana soup, when I was sick with malaria. She stayed with me all day, cooking and talking and simply being with me. So I was preparing a bag with vegetables and soup bouillon when the phone rang. It was my friend saying she had found some painkillers. When I told her I was coming anyway and I was going to cook dinner for her, she said, oh, don't do that. I can order takeout online and have it delivered. 
I thought, yes, of course she can. This is Seattle where you don't have to leave your computer screen and everything can be delivered to your doorstep. But I also experienced a sadness. I know a big part of healing involves having your people close to you to help you. So many times in Maasai land, I had watched a sick person receive a plant remedy in the setting of a secure and comfortable room surrounded by her close people. Yes, the chemical compounds in the plant medicine acted on her illness, but the presence, singing, thoughts, and good wishes of her friends were also vital to her return to good health. The modern way of attending to illness typically involves the mechanical exchange of medicine and advice for money during short and quick sessions with doctors or pharmacists or even alternative healers. And many people, of course, attempt to keep their illnesses secret. The ancient idea that we are all on earth to help heal each other has become lost in the sea of contemporary self-sufficiency. I doubt this is true progress. So suggested practice, next time a friend or family member is sick, stop what you are doing and pay attention. Consider going to visit and make soup or other food for your patient. Make a recipe based on your own cultural tradition or the tradition of your patient, comfort food in other words, food that's familiar and savory. Spend time just talking, allowing your patient to share freely. Yeah, um, this is very uh, good. Um, when somebody sick, we have to sit with him. He might be sick alone, lonely. You don't have any body talk. So you bring the uh, food and you've been uh, one of the family, if it's a friend. For example, Carlo, uh, Carlos is my brother. I don't know him, but we meet here. One is sick, I have to know. Oh, where are you? I meet him, this guy, for two days. He might be sick. You have to go to see his uh, at home and share and ask what is your problem. If you come more, 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 you have to ask his story what is the problem. We share that things. If any problem happened in the family, I think Sean there, my son, you know, because he's been to, to my place, we stay like two years, you know how to sit down and to solve the problems, not go like, like a police or talking. No, 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 no. You have to sit together. What is your problem? And to solve in a good way. So that is the way people are healing because can, somebody can headache or maybe sometimes uh, stomach. It might be they caused by the thinking too much or alone or something cause you have to, to ask in the good way, it's not forcing to be nice. So that is the way <laughs> doctor I tried to explain but I think she's speaking nice English than I do. I, <laughs> I'm a bushman. <laughs> I speak about 13 languages in Africa. <laughs> And the English is a third language for me. Yeah, a lot of this is knowledge is starting to come out in, in modern psychotherapy and other um, advanced sciences. Well, what was surprising to me is this is what the basics were. And uh, now we're finding evidence that this is all, all true. And this is kind of going directly back to, to what the basics are and learning these um, daily practices. Yeah. We'll take questions. Yeah. What about people that you want to help but they may have a contagious disease? Do you go over to their home and, stay and spend time with them even though they could communicate that disease to you? Uh, I mean if somebody is sick, one of your friends or one of your family, you have to ask, but if you don't know somebody and maybe can say, oh, maybe somebody sick. And they look, can you try to find a, a medicinal man or a healing, healer man so you can go and look and then, oh, this is a disease that can help or you can help. So you have to go to the top one. So we have um, different uh, healing. Yeah, a lot of the work we did with the NGO was to uh, combine the traditional medicine with the hospitals in the area. So like um, good friends of ours have a hospital in Karatu. So if it's, you know, some of these diseases that are coming now are, are they've never seen. Like there was not even b malaria up in the colder <coughs> elevations um, 
because the mosquitoes weren't weren't there. Now with climate change, uh, the malaria is coming, and the and the the Maasai communities had never they didn't know what it was. So one of the projects we did was to actually bring in bed nets to the area, and he um, went to the villages and explained, you know, what is a mosquito, what is a carry, and so we combine. Yeah, but yeah. the one thing is the healing, the teaching we have seen, we call you first aid. You teaching the Maasai first aid for the children. For example, somebody uh, uh, get malaria or wounded or stomach, they have to heal themselves before, before you go to the traditional healer. So they know like from four years they're teaching how to, maybe if somebody gets something bad, you can chewing the their uh, lips and can get healed. So it's a different way they teaching kids. But when they when the kid they grow like in um, ten years, twenty to fifteen years can know oh this one can come uh, a tra traditional healer. Yeah. Karib welcome. Are the herbs used for these for these medicines are they declining? Are they still with us? That was our first project, actually. It was a uh, UNDP, United Nations Development Pro Program, that was looking at the conservation status of flora and fauna in the area. And it depends on the area. The, the areas where the cities are expanding, and a lot of the young kids are trying to make a business with the plants because um, a lot of people still use the, the plants, they were harvesting them incorrectly. And that was another project that we did with the NGO, which was to teach the young kids how to take bark from the tree without killing the tree. So some, there's, there's that, uh, they're still around. They're still around. Interest, I found really interesting that, um, like he said, like so said in the beginning, when I came there, I was the um, the first person that really said to keep this medicine alive and how to cultivate it. Um, this I kind of nipped that in the bud in some of the villages because the kids um, didn't want to follow what their grandparents said. You know, they wanted to use the modern stuff. But then uh, they started learning um, when we did it. Remember we hired, the, there was a, a lodge in the area. A lot of lodges wanted to show this medicine uh, to the tourists that came. So we put out a, um, a job advertisement. And I think there were, I don't know, 100 kids from Tanzania coming into our office, Narusha. And so it was showing them the 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 bark and the roots and asking them, do you know what this is? What does it do? And none of them knew. He finally said to one, he goes, go home, talk to your father. I know your father. Come back in two weeks and uh, see if you know these, these plants. So we really tried to conserve. Um, yeah, if, if it's like a young like a, a boy, one is start to take care of the cows or uh, baby cows, you have to learn medicinal trees, the name. First is a tree, you have to know the names of Maasai language. The second, to know how to use that tree. And that tree, we have 122, and you have to put all your head. So if you know in the Maasai, the names, it's easy for you to change in English your botanics names. So it was easy for me to tell, to, when we come and say, you know, this is called Acacia comifera, and the Maasai they use for healing when somebody gets a swallow in their feet or, or, or something wounded, say, oh, so you know, the doctor told me, he asked me, so you know the trees and you know how to use it to heal? It's, oh, yes, everybody must say, you know. So it was easy for us, Masai, to get a, a, a job for tourism because you had to, to explain, you know, when you take somebody, say, oh, this is called the tree, and the name, the Masai, they use this part of the tree to heal themselves, it itself. So it was interesting for her to meet and say, oh, I want somebody who can um, work with us and help the people. So we, we, we put a documentary of medicinal plants 
to the table how they use their masa and put bring to the villages so the kids they can learn that things but in by myself i don't remember i wrote anything but i know from the head you know it's like an elephant you can see you know you have to know everything <laughs> speak to some of the traditional foods that the Maasai consider to be most important for maintaining health and perhaps and please include in your answer foods that would be unusual for most people in this country but that are very valued uh, in Maasai land. Um, actually in Maasai we don't eat any fruits. We don't have a fruit. Fruit is eaten by the birds. We eat, drink milk. The milk have a lot of uh, vitamins. But you don't eat any fruits. But when you are young, because from eight, eight, from eleven years to fifteen years, you can go to the bush and at that time not to cross the circumcision of the boys. So you can allow to eat everything. But when you finish that, when after circumcision is come a warrior, you can do anything like your fruit. You can oh, why well, you eat the, the grass? You are the, you are not allowed to eat the grass. You are not allowed to, to eat a, a, a fruits. That is for wildlife. So the people, you want to change it slowly, poly, poly, you know, they call it poly, poly, slowly. You change them to, to reach to the summit. You know, even myself, I don't eat a fish. I try to tell me it's the fish, but, oh, sometimes my culture, <laughs> oh, I'm alleged, but I don't feel like, oh, but you have to go poly, poly, slowly. So they pretty much subsist on livestock, Cow, cattle? sheep and goats and they eat they use every part of the animal milk is really the um, sustenance and they don't eat meat every day you know maybe a couple times a week but when they eat meat they eat meat <laughs> and th but the other thing traditionally they they um, make a soup of Medicinal. medicinal plants and actually a, a researcher in in the UK found that the plants that they use for that soup break down the cholesterol in the in the meat so they can eat a lot of meat but then they expel the, the bad parts and keep the protein the good proteins in the body they knew this traditionally there's a chapter in here on our section on our pool, which is the healing retreat, where warriors go and eat a lot of meat to strengthen for, for war. Yeah. When you say meat, does that include organ meats and bone marrow? Everything. Mm -hmm. Except the eyes. And the, and the, and the, uh, the, uh, the leaves or whatever it is? The inside of the stomach. Yeah, the they eat that stomach. first? No, they don't eat uh, some from the stomach or the slow way. <laughs> no, the no, no. green mm. stuff. The green. Oh, yeah. yeah. What is what is it? It's like wheatgrass. Yeah. And you eat that first, or you eat it with the meat? No. Grass. I've see, I've seen. Oh. You know, mm. remember when they open the stomach, and I've seen them eat the. Um, the they eat digest. The, the, they they eat the liver. And they don't eat any, the grass is throw away all the stuff from the grass. I not eat. Maybe we should change this. Welcome to <laughs> dinner time. Is it? <laughs> Another question. question. Yeah. I have several questions. Does every village have a medicine man? Does a medicine man learn from another medicine man or go to medicine man school? Or, <laughs> I like um, one. How, how do they train? Mm. Uh, is it just passed down from person to person? Um, actually, this one you get from your dad. When he, he was at, at Shino Hila, when they die, give you all the tool and make a ceremony and blessing you for that. For example, my dad passed away three years ago, and he was the one. I, we have a Western doctor. I, my sister, she's a posited by the Germany, the um, uh, nurse. But myself, the daddy says, this one is this guy. You had to take to this is stick to use for healing the people and give me a condition. Don't use for killing or don't use for make a bad things. In Maasai, we have a medicinal plant like in 
um, drugs, you, somebody can make you like a powder, you guys have here. And then you can put it here, come drunk completely. But you don't do that. If you do that, the day you're going to die. And you, you have to trust. Because they say, a, a guy, he keep you to know this medicinal plant for a good way. But don't give somebody a, a medicine you know, to go to steal their property of somebody, or to kill somebody, or to make a fool somebody. When you, you and you said, my son, you're going to die. That is a, a, com a command from my grandfather. So we, somebody medicinal plant, they endless going, giving you a son. Because the first son is the name of your father. The second son is the name of your mother wife. So they can see which part is very strong. So that you can get a willing to take, to come a traditional healer. There's, there's the, the medicine, there's like two kinds of medicine people. There's the herbalists and then there's the spiritual healers. And a lot of people know the medicinal plants, even the little kids when I first went out for the UN project. All these little kids, like six years old, would grab my hand and sing to me the, the plants and what they were used for. It was just part of what they learn when they're, when they're kids. And some people enjoy it more and, and learn more of the plants. Um, but then there's, in the family line, more of the, sp the spiritual healers. It's, it's a, a calling, like a, a purpose in life that if that, if you begin to have a strong intuition and your parents see that, um, the father will support that and, and teach, yeah. Somebody can't be cured by the medicine man. Do they go to a Western medicine man? Do they go to a city? To a yeah, now, now there's pretty much the influence of the town everywhere. Um, there's a section in the book about his father. Well, there, he had three fathers. All the, all the brothers of your father are also your father. We would call uncle, they call father. Yeah. Kapara uh, was, was um, diagnosed with, with cancer uh, and was in a Western hospital and um, couldn't take the chemicals and left. Went back to the village and, and they had given him six months to live. He lasted six years on the medicinal plants. Um, and vice versa, that people will now come into town and use it's changing, you know. I, I, the ten years that I was there, our our NGO had a have a has a relation with a hospital, and um, you know it's it's interesting because a lot of the doctors there remember the medicine, um, and to combine the two, you know, to support the system, um, even people with HIV. AIDS can take a lot of the medicinal plants to support the immune system while they're taking the cocktail, the um, ARVs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know the cow is the measure of wealth, you know, for the Maasai. How does that work into your title? Time is money. Yeah. Time is cows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We value the time, like, to do something, but we we'll won't make it. In this one, it takes a long time to discuss about time is called what's the meaning. It really brings the meaning, reason. And I thought, oh, because everything we do in the community is valued by the time. And I give you one example. If you've been, how many have you been to Africa? Okay, in the jungle like Serengeti. Serengeti or maybe so. That they not, okay. If you come with a, uh, with a card, you have a card you just put in the machine and vomiting the money. You come to my village, no, no hotel machine, no hotel. I have my cows, my sheep, my goat. And you have a lot of US dollar like this. You can survive for that money in the bush without food. You can't eat that money, that money but you have to go away to find the food. <laughs> so <coughs> if you don't have a cows or anything in the massa, you are poor. And you can't marry the woman if you are poor. Nothing you can do. You are poor, you are poor. You got to go to somebody else, you have um, cows, take care, I can pay you one cow a year. 
maybe for 10 years you can get maybe 20 cows then that you can start your own life but time is cows time is value for every Maasai life Negotiate a marriage? Uh, no, it's fixed. It's the 45 cows. If you want to marry the lady tall, super, <laughs> you have to say, uh huh. So if you don't have a cows, you can't get married. <laughs> <laughs> and in Maasai, no divorce. <laughs> Do the Maasai recognize differences between the cow, goat, and sheep milk, one in their health effects on people, and two in their energetic effects on people? Um, actually, um, they don't do that, like all the things, because we have a lot of cows. You know Maasai, they just deal with only, well, like, well, only cows, cattle. But is the co goat milk we better than cow's milk? Mm, or cow? Other people, they say goat is good, but in myself, oh, I never use that because we have a lot of cows. My daddy have always about 3,000 cows and uh, we yeah. Yeah, the like nine wives, so we are about, <laughs> we are about 49, 48, 48 brothers. Yeah. But we don't, I don't know my mom, I don't know which is my mom, I know. I told him my, your mother I'm passing away 72, so all is my mom and uh, all my brothers. You see, by biological, you can't know really. I had to make a very investigation and careful. Because my brother died, my, we are, we are, there are three, all my father. The time is went to the village, he said, huh, what do you really biological for? They say, Tanya, I don't know all my father. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what happens if you're a person like, like your father that has a lot of... Uh, people to support or that depend on, on him and like a disease come that kills a lot of those cows. Um, how does that work? Because a lot of people, the wives and the sons and daughters, depend on, on his cows. Basically. Yeah, actually we are not staying the one place together. They have to go, because the rain, you know the rain? is raining different region. So you have to move like uh, two weeks, you just ride your cows to their destination. So we are noticing that one they can, one they can um, start from the water, the others they can survive. So like if you have like uh, four, uh, four wives, you can put the same place. You can put two and another one, two to maybe Atlanta two, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> and maybe, yeah, in the quality to put the, uh, you want to become a rich of the cows, so you, can, you have to separate. <laughs> So yeah, all the cows are not together. They yeah. have, a, they diversify their portfolio. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the water goes bad, or there's a disease in a certain group, it will only affect a small group. Oh, if you're a smart, clever, yeah. Actually, our cow is not yours. We have a two cows. They call Sebo and Inkole. That one can stay like 20 days, no water. So, and you must say, we are walking far away to find the water for the cows. You have to, you, you know, our, our, our vehicle is the donkeys, which is the four wheel never stuck. We take him with the jug and then we, and one family can use like a two, 20 liters of water for two, one month because the water we are not uh, drinking. The, probably won't like this, but it, it interests me that when I saw the Maasai, the men were basically just sort of walking around with a stick, you know, herding the cows. The women were carrying huge bundles <coughs> on their backs and building the houses and doing all the work, just like the lions, the lions sit and wait for the females to do the kill and then they come in <coughs> and eat and then the females get the leftovers. I, I, to me the Maasai kind of work the same way. What do you think? Yeah, um, <laughs> really, um. Maybe I'll answer that. I'll answer that one because I, I, I really struggled with that, you know, point where. Um, yeah. So is it true? Well, what I, I, what I struggled with was um, how do you um, write about a culture um, uh, 
as a package, you know, that you look at it and say, okay, that's a great culture. Look at all the things that they do. But at the same time, I thought about this culture in, in, in America, and not everything that we do is great yeah. either. So I, de I decided, you know what, I'm not going to crack my head over it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the gems of wisdom <laughs> that work in their culture that we could learn from. Um, one thing I will say that I learned about, about gender relations in Maasai, um, women have a lot of respect. I mean, the fact that, that um, a lot of their language uses the feminine, um, I was amazed at, the, at how a lot of the men view women as, as the creator, as mom, as, as a lot, it's, it's, a, it's a different angle of gender than we are used to. Um, but from our view, that first look is like, wait a minute, the men just sit around and the women do all the work. Kind of the same oh. here. Um, <laughs> so, in different kind of ways, you know. Different yeah, different degrees. Different degrees. And actually, um, when we married the wife, uh, oh, if you have a ho your house and no wife, they never call you house. You just say like a heart, no anybody there. But if you married, you have a house, you have a wife and a cow, they say bo angang, boma, is a boma, they really community now this guy's come. You know, you like you are a patriarch, you like well known men in the community. And if you have more wife, in the way you can have many uh, houses, the way you go respect. And the wife is working hard really, but the men they protect. The men you have to go far away to look where the what where the rain is and take the cows, bring the cows with them. They are milking in order to feed the kids. So but the wife is very expensive to get a wife, and that is why <laughs> that is why a wife is do everything because you know I'm coming, I'm come to Sululu to support to have many uh, many wives, many family for good karma. That they, so they you have, have to treat her very well mm. because if she mm. there's not like what we would call divorce, but she can run away if she's not treated well, and that's a big shame. And you've lost your whole investment. investment. Yeah. So you see what I'm trying to say? It's like you have to look <laughs> at it in, in um, You have to rationalize. You know, yeah. Push well, you have to. Yeah. You, um, you guys, the question is have uh, this we say, we say bring indigenous to the modern. Now the indigenous come to the modern people. So we try to explain. Or, uh, you know, I'm happy really. I, I never get tired. Because I learned a lot of things from you. Well, the time I've been working with the tourism, but I, I, there are many things they're hiding about the culture, you see. But the question we ask you, I like it. Karibu, welcome. Is Last there a significance or meaning to your stick? Okay. Know. This is stick. The wise men only get from the elder. For example, if I die, I have to go to give my, my son. Say, use this one when you go to the meeting, when you go to the conference. Is the, uh, the freedom, the like um, good wishes, e, you know? So it's very, very important. And you can see, you know, and, you know um, these things, they're hiding because masses don't give the secret. When Tanya comes to the village, they have a lot of things he never know about it. But when he come close, they say, oh, this is a good lady to share with her. So this is a stick is a sign of wise things. And the beadwork? Yeah, it's made by my first wife. <laughs> they put it here and then look like it's nice. You can see even yourself who like it, is it? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a decoration, but it might be black inside. Mm. Welcome. Oh, we have to. practice the old custom of killing a lion because there's such a problem with the um, not as many lions as they were, let's say, many years ago. They, you don't do that anymore, correct? There's no more 
Actually, they are doing, the, you know, the, to kill a lion, it has a lot of reason. It's like a ritual things. The For ritual. The, uh, the ritual. Uh, but there was a long time when I was a, a warrior, you, everyone had to kill a lion. But nowadays, they don't do that. Because the conservation, many people now, government, they try to protect yeah. a lion. But yeah. when there are the, some ritual, yeah, they get a, um, they get a, permi a permission. Because we have a thing they call edge set. For example, uh, Sean there, uh, can you stand up? <laughs> uh, Sean is, is like my son. So his edge is now the warrior leading the, okay, sit down. Leading the, <laughs> is, is the example I give you is like his son, is my son, the edge of my, my son. So when they want to come the elder to, to, to rule, to be the, like a military, they have to go to kill a lion. The, uh, in the uh, compound. So when they kill a lion, maybe the, w the men, they say, okay, which men, which warrior are going to kill a lion? From Miami or Seattle or maybe uh, Atlanta? Say, oh, let us kill from Atlanta. All they, they found a leader of there, they wearing the lion uh, skin to show, to bless them that is age set of them. That is the meaning to kill a lion. But the time myself I kill a lion was very good. Because there was no government that time. <laughs> <laughs> You kill a lion, they train you three months to kill a lion, and it was very tough to face the lion. Oh, I can't even talk about it here. When I, to, when I tell you how to kill a lion, you're going to cry. <laughs> I don't want to say that. <laughs> and we have to not do that anymore. They w no, no, they, no don't. they don't do that. Okay, we have to finish. Thank you very much, Dr. Pergola and Salula. <laughs> All right, so a quick reminder for our internet audience watching at home, there's still time to call the number on the screen. You can purchase a copy of the book. We will get it signed, and we will ship it to you wherever you are in the U.S. free of charge. Also a reminder that all of our live streamed events are archived, so if you don't get a chance to watch it live, you could visit the Books and Books website. Go to the live streaming link, and any appearance that we have broadcast from here at the store will be saved there for you to watch at your convenience. Uh, for those of you here in the house, we have Time is Cows for sale at the counter over there. Tanya and Sululu are going to be signing over there at the table to the left of the screen, and this has been so fascinating. Let's please give them another hand. Thanks very much. All right. <laughs>